Hello, health champions. Today, we're going to talk about what happened when I ate 100 tablespoons of olive oil in 10 days. And I'm going to show you some blood work that I did before and after and explain the changes. Now, there are some popular trends with the Mediterranean diet where they talk about the benefits of olive oil because it's cholesterol free and it has monounsaturated fatty acids. Now, we've talked a lot about cholesterol on this channel and how much you eat in the diet is really completely irrelevant. And yes, I'm all in favor of monounsaturated fatty acids, but they're not necessarily any better than saturated fatty acids when it comes to fuel. What matters is the quality, and we're going to go into that some as well. And then they promote this because they say this is great to lower the risk of heart disease and diabetes. Now let's jump straight into the blood work that I did and we'll show you my blood glucose control, how well controlled my blood sugar levels were. So glucose is supposed to be somewhere between 65 to 88. The official range goes up to 100, but really you want to keep it in the 80s ideally. And mine is running just a couple of points high before I was 91 and after I was 89. Now, we can also talk about margin of error to understand that everything changes and these are not necessarily significant changes. My hemoglobin A1c, which is a 90-day average of blood glucose, was supposed to be 4.8 to 5.3, and I started at 5.3 and ended at 5.3, so no change there. I'm in the optimal range. Insulin is the hormone that controls blood glucose, and a good range is between 2 and 5. Now, this is optimal. This is if you're very insulin sensitive, like you're supposed to be. The average population runs much, much higher, and a normal lab range is considered all the way up to 25, which typically means that you're borderline or full-blown diabetic. So I started at 4.2, which was right in the middle of that range. And then after I was at 6.6, .6, which is the highest that I've been. But before you jump to conclusions, we are going to talk about this. And I don't blame the olive oil for this. So let's just take a really quick look at blood glucose and understand that the body wants to keep it within a very narrow range. And whenever you eat something, the blood sugar levels go up. But then we have a hormone called insulin that is supposed to also rise with a slight delay. And then as insulin rises, it brings blood glucose down. And then as insulin, as glucose is brought down again, now insulin can also come down. So if we just look at glucose, we don't really know how insulin resistant someone is because it could be that they have this curve with glucose, but what if it takes this much insulin to do the same job? Then that person would be twice as insulin resistant. And that's what we're measuring with a HOMA IR, which stands for Homeostatic Model Assessment of insulin resistance. So now what we do is we multiply the glucose by the insulin. So we get an idea of how much effort is the body expending at keeping the blood glucose down. So we multiply insulin by glucose, we divide by 405, which is just a random constant to bring a good number in the range of one. So anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5, you're doing fairly well. And I started off at 0 0.9 and I ended up at 1.5. So I would still be kind of in the optimal range, but this are some of the highest numbers that I've seen for myself. And just as a contrast, if you recall, I did a video earlier where I fasted for 100 hours and I showed a strongly fasted blood work. And after 100 hours, I had a HOMA IR of 0 0.12. And I'm not measuring that as something good. Lower isn't better. One is a good number. But it just shows you how 
dietary changes like a long fast can really have an impact on things. And while glucose and A1C don't necessarily change a lot very fast, Things like insulin and HOMA IR can change faster. Now, here is the number one challenge with consuming that much olive oil. And that is that you have to find something to absorb all that oil. You have to find food that kind of acts as a sponge. And one dish that I found that's really good is tabbouleh and another one is broccoli. These are very absorbent. So on this plate, you'll see over here, this is tabbouleh, which is parsley, chopped onion, chopped lemon, and I use pecan nuts instead of rice, and then you drench it in olive oil. So a single serving like this could hold as much as three tablespoons of olive oil. And then broccoli is also really good. You can drizzle it. If you cook it in the oven, you roast it, you can drizzle a good bit of olive oil on it. And then another one would be eggs and stir fried vegetables. So an egg, if you stir fry it, you can, or scramble it, then you can use up to 10 grams, like two teaspoons of olive oil per egg and also put a good bit into the stir-fried vegetables. And another one would be eggplant. That is nature's perfect sponge for olive oil and you can get a tremendous amount. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that you should try to drench your food in oil. It's just what I did because I had a goal. I'm not suggesting that's a great idea. But these are good examples of what you could eat if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're trying to get some good variety, some good vegetables, and keep the fat content high as well. And this, some of these dishes would even work if you're vegan. A few more foods that I tried was to stir it into yogurt, and I can't really recommend that. Uh, it was edible, but the olive oil kind of took over and I didn't like that flavor so much. You can also use it with avocado. If you do a guacamole, you could stir in some extra olive oil. And of course, bread is another sponge. Now I talk a lot about low carb and bread does not fit into that. I tried bread once here on this diet because it's such a popular part of the Mediterranean diet but I wouldn't recommend that on a regular basis. Now, 100 tablespoons of olive oil is a lot of fat. It's 1.5 liters of oil, 6.3 cups. And if you compare it to butter, it's actually a lot more because butter is only 80% fat and olive oil is 100% fat. If you weigh it, it's a little lighter than water. It's like 0.9 grams per milliliter. So it's 1,350 grams. You multiply that by nine to get calories, which is 12,150 calories that I ate from olive oil in 10 days. Out of 30,000 calories, that was my total. That's about 40%, which may seem like it, a huge astronomical number, but there are places like Crete where they don't eat as much total olive oil, but 35% of their calories are coming from olive oil. And I had to hit my 100 tablespoons, so that ended up being about 65% more than they did. And as a result, I went from 195 pounds, which is already a little heavier than I wanna be, up to 197. So I gained weight on this diet, and this was despite the fact that I increased exercise a good bit. Now, what I'm trying to say with this is, in a simple word, I ate too much, I overate. And this is really important to understand as we look at some of the results on the blood work, because it's not just the quality of the foods that you eat, it is also how much. When we break down the macros, I ate a total amount of 2,590 grams of fat, 888 grams of protein, and 535 grams of carbs. And I also did what they do in many of those countries. I had a glass of red wine seven days out of 10. 
So when we look at the percentages of calories, we had 79% from fat, 12% from protein, 7% from carbohydrates, and 5% from wine. Another important part of blood work is to look at kidney function, adrenal function, and inflammation. So the primary markers here is sodium. And sodium is supposed to be between 135 and 142 milligrams per deciliter. I was 141 before and 138 after. And I assure you it was not because I ate less sodium. So we're gonna talk about that. Then we have the second one is potassium. And potassium is supposed to be between four and four and a half. And now these are optimal ranges. The lab ranges that you get standard on your blood work are gonna be much, much wider than this. And I was 4.5 before and I was 4.6 after. So just a slight increase above the optimal range there. And on most blood work, they're gonna include the ratio between sodium and potassium. So you divide one by the other, and now you're supposed to be between 30 and 35. And I started off before I had 31.4 and after I was at 30.0. So what does this mean? Like I said, I didn't eat any less sodium. So this comes back to how the body regulates fluid. And as we filter the blood, we push a lot of fluid through the kidneys. We push about 200 liters of water through the kidneys. They filter that out. And with all that water goes all the sodium as well because it's dissolved in the water. And then the body reabsorbs 99.5% of all that water and 99.5% of all the sodium. So if I don't change my sodium consumption and my levels go down, that means that my body probably changed from reabsorbing 99.5 to 99.4 or something like that. I'm just grabbing some numbers. But what that means is also that potassium at the same time is probably going to go up because there's something in the kidney called the sodium potassium pump. So we push the water out and then as we reabsorb the sodium for every three molecules of sodium we pull back in we kick two potassium back out so if we reabsorb less sodium that means we're kicking less potassium out and that's why we're interested in this ratio because if this ratio drops too low that means that the kidneys are not really reabsorbing to the degree the sodium potassium pump isn't cranking quite as well as it should and now that gets into the adrenals so the adrenals are the little stress glands that sit on top of the kidney and they make a hormone called aldosterone and aldosterone is what drives this sodium potassium pump so if your adrenals are getting a little tired if you have a lot of stress if you're getting some adrenal fatigue and they make less aldosterone, then the sodium potassium pump is gonna crank a little slower and this number is going to go down. So this all sort of fits once we understand the bigger picture. And one more marker we can look at is called chloride. And it's supposed to be between 100 and 106 and mine went from 103 to 99. So this also makes sense because as you know, salt is sodium chloride and they go together. You eat them as this white crystal called sodium chloride and then it dissolves in water. But these guys, the sodium and the chloride, they still hang out together. And if you lose one, you lose the other. So you could see that we lost almost exactly the same amount of sodium as we did the chloride. So it's just more ways of understanding and verifying and seeing if things fit. And during this time, I did have a lot of stress. I had a lot of stuff to do. It was hard to get all the sleep in. And another interesting marker is called high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So this is a protein that the liver makes in response to inflammation. So anytime that number goes up, you have more inflammation in your body. And it's supposed to be really, really low, like zero 
to 1, 0 to 0.99, and mine is normally 0 0.3. It's usually like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 something, very, very low. And now I had the highest number that I've ever had, which still is in the optimal range, is still below the average population, but it is still a sign of inflammation that something was going on. And here we're getting back to what I was talking about with the overeating, that as you overeat, as you push more food in than the body needs, whether it's high quality or not, obviously high quality is, is better, all things being equal, but when you eat too much, you create a little bit of insulin resistance and you start driving a low-grade inflammation. Next, we want to look at the lipids, cholesterol and lipids, blood fats. So total cholesterol is, in my book, ideal between 170 and 270. I've done some other videos around cholesterol and the official limit is at 200, but I believe that if all other markers look good, you're totally fine from about 170 to 270. And I was at 233 before, and I was at 240 after, so no significant change there. My LDL cholesterol was supposed to be about 120 to 170, and again, official ranges are less than 100. I started at 146 and I went to 161. So it went up slightly, but not really significant. And we're gonna talk about significance also. My HDL went from 69 to 69. No change and a good range is from 55 to 75. And then we have triglycerides, which is the blood fats. How much fat is floating in your blood? And most people believe that if you eat 100 tablespoons of olive oil, you're just saturating your body with liquid fat, that that would raise your blood fats. But that's not how it works because the blood only transports it to the cells. And if the cells are not resistant, if you are metabolically sensitive and flexible, the cells will soak up those blood fats, those triglycerides, and they don't stick around in the bloodstream. The time that your triglycerides go up is if your cells are resistant. If they're insulin resistant, they're resistant to fuels, and now your triglycerides have no place to go, and that's why they would go up. So a good range is between 50 and 90, and I started out at 65, and I went to 62. And I put a little asterisk there because we're going to look at this on the next slide as well. But basically, there are no significant changes here. And you want to understand blood work that if you get blood work and you run a baseline and then you make some changes and you follow up in three months, you want to celebrate positive changes. But you also don't want to nitpick. You want to understand that there is variations to this, that there is a margin of error to all lab work, to all measurements of physical entities. There's a margin of error. So have you noticed when you go to the lab and they draw your blood, they're going to take not one vial, but they take four, five, six, seven vials. Why is that? Because depending on the different panels that you want them to examine, they're gonna send it to different departments. And for example here, when they measure cholesterol, they're gonna do your basic lipid panel in one place, and they're gonna do an NMR panel in another place if you have requested a specific NMR panel, which we always do, which measures cholesterol particles, etc. But here's the point that cholesterol, total cholesterol is something that they actually measure. They don't calculate it, they measure it. And in one lab that did the regular measurement, we got 240, on the other one, we got 239. So these were very, very close, only about a 0.4% different, that's excellent. Now, when we look at LDL, low density lipoproteins, then I marked that in yellow because this is not something that they measure, they calculate LDL because it's much too complicated to try to fit to measure it on a standard panel. 
And at one lab, they measured it or calculated it at 161 and another one calculated at 154. And they calculate this based on co total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides, which we're going to look at next here. So now we have a 4.3% error, which is still quite reasonable. But if you had gone to one place and it's 161 or at, and you had another test at a later time and it was 154, you can't assume that it changed because it's within the margin of error. HDL was at 69 in one place and 72 in another lab. So again, 4.3% error. Uh, so cholesterol, HDL, and triglycerides, they measure. So even though it wasn't a calculation, they actually measure triglycerides. Uh, here's the 62 with the asterisk. This is what they found in one lab, and another lab they found 77. So again, nothing earth shattering because it's they're both in the optimal range, but the point is, that even though it's something that they measure from the same blood sample taken into two different vials, but from the same vein on the same minute, we get a 24% difference. So there's a margin of error built in. And a lot of the small, subtle changes that you see on blood work aren't really changes. They're just mar within the margin of error. And this is why you don't want to nitpick blood work. You don't want to look at a tenth or a single point and try to conclude that something changed. That you want to understand the bigger picture and you want to see trends and tendencies over time. Now, the, the markers I'm showing here, the cholesterol total, the LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglycerides, these are all part of a standard panel. And even though my insulin resistance changed a little bit, there's really no significant change here. And this is why these markers are relatively useless in terms of understanding inflammation and heart disease risk. What we really want to do is a much more detailed cholesterol panel called an NMR. And here we measure the particle number, the number of LDL particles, because it's the number of particles that increases the risk and the size of the particles that increase the risk. So a large number of small particles is a bad thing. And there's very difficult to come up with an optimal range here. The standard range is that you have less than a thousand particles is a good thing. I think it can be a good bit higher if your particles are large, but still fewer particles are better. I started out with 1,232 and afterwards I had 1,726. So that's not a good trend. When it comes to the number of small particles, meaning they're measured in nanometers and the number of particles less than 20.5 nanometers, it's considered small. Again, they recommend that on the official range, they want that less than 500. I think it's much better to look at a percentage of those particles than the absolute number. But again, less is better. And I started out at 200 and I went to 613. And again, these are both are probably the highest numbers that I have ever seen. When it comes to the LDL size, 21.5 and up are good numbers. So again, 20.5 is the cutoff. Anything bigger than that is better, but you really want to try to get into the 25, 21 and a half range. I started at 21.6 and I went to 21.4, so a slight decrease in size. And here's one of the more important markers in my mind. They don't list this on the blood work itself, but if you take the number of small particles and you divide it into the total number of LDL particles, you get the percentage. And I would like to see that under 20%. You can get it even lower, I've been down as low as 6 or 7%. And 
Before the blood work here, I was at 16%. And again, these are things that fluctuate quite a bit, more actually than the milligrams that you usually see on lipid panels. But I went all the way up to 36%, which is probably the highest number that I have seen. Now let's talk a little bit about monounsaturated fatty acids versus saturated fatty acids, because monounsaturated, which is the vast majority of fat and olive oil is monounsaturated, and that's why they say it's so great for you, which I agree with. I don't think there's any problem with it, but they also villainize the saturated fatty acids, and they say that those are horrible. And I don't believe that. I think that monounsaturated and saturated, if they come from a good quality source, are equally good. So if you eat organic extra virgin olive oil or if you eat organic grass-fed butter, I think they are equally healthy. Now, some people are gonna say, well, look at your numbers here. You ate all this olive oil and your numbers got worse. And the carnivores are gonna say, oh, it's because you ate the olive oil, it's a plant product, that's terrible. And the vegans are gonna say, no, it's because you also had eggs and meat. But here's what I believe. I think they're equally safe. And the reason my numbers got worse goes back to what I said before, that I was overeating. That was a lot of food to cover, and then when you stuff your system, when you almost force feed yourself, you will make your cells more resistant. You will drive up inflammation a little bit, even if it's perfectly good food. Now, here's something we want to understand about the time frames. So I do these things for 10 days because that's as long as I can stand doing something extreme. And we want to understand that we all have a genetic tendency towards something. We have a genetic tendency toward insulin resistance and toward various conditions. And we also have a lifestyle. And these two factors, they kick in from birth. So if you're 50 years old, these factors have been in play for 50 years. They have been moving you in a certain direction for 50 years. And then when they do a medical study, they could give someone a medication, they do a placebo group and so forth, but then they have to wait. They have to run these things for a period of time. And ultimately what they're trying to do is to reduce the risk of heart disease. And they're looking for a change in what they call cardiac events, less heart attacks, basically. But if we already been going for all of our lives so far, it's very difficult to make changes in a short period of time. So even though a lot of these studies go for several years, that's very often not even long enough to really discern if they make a difference. What you can do is you can look at the markers. You can look at the blood markers that we know indicate this. And now you can make changes in days to weeks, which is what I'm showing with these little experiments. Now here's what you need to understand, that when I do a little stunt like this, we have an n of 1. The sample size of this study is 1, which means it's not very relevant at all. If we called it a study, it would be a really bad study. And furthermore, even if it was something valid that we found out, if we just have one person, that may be different from another person. So just because something worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So what you want to take away from this are the principles and the fact that you can make changes quickly. And if you understand what you're going to look for, changes can happen in days. And the causal factors, the strongest causal factors for heart disease is insulin resistance, and we measure that very effectively with HOMA IR, insulin, and glucose. Uh, the other markers we talked about, like triglycerides, are also very useful. And then, as far as heart disease, the important factors are the lipids, triglycerides, uh, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, but then the 
LDL particle count and the LDL size. Now, here's the interesting part that the insulin resistance markers, they address the cause. They measure the risk for heart disease, for causing heart disease, for driving the process of inflammation. And the LDLP, the particle count and the size, measure the risk of heart disease. Now, these are both things we can change relatively fast. They change much, much faster than the traditional markers. And just to prove that point, I don't know if you guys saw the 100-hour fast that I did and I reported in a video. And my home IR went from 0.7 to 0.12. So a dramatic reduction. And again, I'm not saying 0.12 is, is a good thing. I'm just saying that things can change quickly. You can make significant changes fast. And then when we measured LDL in milligrams and LDL in the particle count, this was really, really interesting because in milligrams, it went from 146 to 169. So it went up by 16%. Even though I ate nothing, the total amount of cholesterol, LDL cholesterol increased in my bloodstream, but the particle count went from 1709 to 12. 22, which is a drop of 30%. Now, this is huge. This is enormous that you can raise total cholesterol, which is irrelevant, and lower your LDL particle count dramatically, which is very, very significant. So if you understand what I've been talking about, you understand you don't have to be afraid of the monounsaturated fats in olive oil. You don't have to be afraid of the saturated fats in butter or animal products either. And you should not overeat. You should not pull stunts like I have done where you force feed yourself a bunch of fat. The only time that's okay is when you're gonna make a YouTube video about it. If you enjoyed this video, you're gonna love that one. And if you truly wanna master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.